Brother Jerry Jones, our general secretary. Let's worship that great name right now. Hallelujah. Glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Let me say again what an honor to be Florida camp meeting. I so appreciate the wonderful spirit that we feel here. It's good to be with my good friend, Brother Mooney. And if you were unable to be here today, you owe it to yourself to get the media of that message today and make it part of your life. Second Kings chapter 6. We'll start reading at verse 1. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. That means small. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, One said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And Elisha answered, I will go. So, he went with them. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And Elisha cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore, said he, take it up to thee. And he put out his hand, and he took it. I want to preach a little while tonight about this axe head. God bless you. Thank you. Please be seated. Elijah had established a Bible school. Young men from all over who felt the call of God came there to study under the great miracle performing prophet to prepare themselves for the prophetic ministry. After Elijah was caught up in a fiery chariot into heaven, his successor, Elisha, continued the Bible school. It was, it, was not, it was not new. It had been in use some time. And they had a problem. A good problem, I suppose, but a problem nevertheless. They had outgrown their facilities. Now, there's several remarkable things in this story. I think... I think the very first one is that the young men themselves saw a need and not waiting for the leadership to inspire them or instruct them, they developed a solution to the problem and took it 
to Elisha for his approval. Now any pastor in here would tell you that this is a remarkable occurrence. I remember years ago, Brother George Glass Sr. telling about when he would get really stressed out, he would get in his car and he would drive down the road to a train crossing. And he would park his old car beside the road and wait for the train to come by. And he found particular comfort in that freight train roaring past the road where he sat. And someone asked him, Brother Glass, what is it about that train going by that brings you comfort? He said, you know, I just like to see something every once in a while go that I don't have to push. I don't know how astonished Elisha was. I don't know how taken aback he must have been when the young men, when the recipients of the blessing themselves recognized there's a need here. Wouldn't it be something if folks in a church saw a need? Oh, I know I'm meddling, but I'm on meddle. It's early in the sermon. I'll make up for it later. I, wouldn't it be something if, if, if somebody saw a need and didn't think they ought to take care of that, but instead thought I ought to take care of that? Wouldn't that be something? No wonder when they came to Elisha and they outlined their plan, a simple plan, but an effective plan, and they outlined it to Elisha, he said, go! He didn't have to think about it. He didn't have to mull it over. Go do it. Now their plan was simple. There was nothing complex about it. There was nothing... Um, particularly uh, brilliant about it, but it was, it was incredibly effective. Here was their plan. We need a bigger Bible school. We need a bigger building where we remain with the prophet and where we learn from the prophet. And so here's what we're gonna do. We're going to build a new Bible school. And here is how we're gonna do it. We're gonna go down to the Jordan we're going to cut down trees. We're going to square them up, make beams out of them. And we're going to carry those beams uh, to the building site. And we're going to build the Bible school. Now, the plan was simple. No one was expected to carry more than he could. But everyone was expected to carry all that he could. You pick the tree out. You could cut a little old sapling if you wanted to. Carry it up the hill in one hand. And say, I got a door frame here. Or you could fell a big old tree. Trim it up muscle it up on your shoulder and carry it up the hill and say, this is for the foundation. You can do whatever you want. God is waiting for you to decide. You can carry as big a beam as you wish to. Isn't it time for everybody to get as big a weight, get behind this thing, pour themselves into it, make the sacrifice, pay the price, do what they can for the kingdom of God to progress. I don't know about 
you, but I don't believe in the 80-20 rule for the church, for the kingdom of God. I don't believe 20% of the folks uh, ought to do most or 80% of the work. I don't believe 20% ought to give 80% of the offering. I don't think 20% ought to do 80% of the worshiping. I don't think 20% ought to do 80% of the commitment. I believe it's time for 100%. God isn't asking for more than you can do, but he is asking for all that you can do. Oh, hallelujah. I said hallelujah. They were excited about their plan. They couldn't wait. They went to the man of God. They outlined their plan. We're all gonna do our part. Everybody's gonna carry as big a beam as he can carry. And we're gonna build a new Bible school. And when Elisha the prophet said, go, I see them boiling out of that little Bible school, running to get down to the river bottom and began chopping down those trees. They were enthused. They were excited. It was not a weight, a burden. It was not a demand, a commitment. They didn't see it as his duty. They saw it as opportunity. They saw it as pleasure. They saw it as a chance to help build the kingdom of God. As only young people can, they were caught up in the enthusiasm of the challenge. And they just ran out of that place. And I, I, the Bible doesn't say so, but I've always imagined in my mind that it was the very last one. All the rest of them were already running down the hill. But the last guy out the door, something struck him. He stopped and he turned around. Bible says one, just one. It wasn't the cry of the bunch. It was just one that happened almost as an afterthought. And said, Elisha, master, Will you go with us? Let me tell you, I don't want to go if Jesus don't go. I'm not interested in a future that leaves him out. I want his presence and his spirit in everything we do. I don't care how rich we get. I don't care how filled with skill, ability, education we get. We better not forget to invite the master to come along on every mission. Will you go? Once again, there's no hint of hesitation. He simply said, I will go. The Bible emphasizes the importance of this moment because the very next sentence says, so he went. Repetition is the scripture's italics. It emphasizes important points. Don't ever miss those repetitive expressions in scripture. He said, I will go. And so he went. It's good he was there. One fella, one Bible school student, filled with energy and strength and enthusiasm, He's chopping away at a tree. He hits it about three times maybe. His back's to the river. And he swings that ax handle back to make one more massive blow. And the ax head comes off the handle. It spins through the air. Thank God it went out over the river. Might have killed somebody if it hadn't. And it plunked right in the middle of the muddy Jordan River, sank in an instant through that muddy water and buried itself on that silty bottom. Now, I like this guy. I like him for a lot of reasons. He made a mistake, but he realized where he was. He realized that he had lost what it took to get the job done. He lost what translated human strength 
and human ability into the operation that accomplished what needed to be done. Without the sharp edge of that axe head, you're not bringing down a tree. I don't care how long you whack it with an empty axe handle, you'll never get it down. You'll shatter the axe handle and you'll bruise the bark of the tree, but you'll never get the kingdom of God built. He recognized, I lost the power. Some people don't seem to realize when they've lost the power. Perhaps they hope that nobody noticed. And if they just keep going through the motions, nobody will realize the tree never comes down. I mean, he's working. He's swinging that ax handle. Man, he goes to a seminar. He learns better ways to grip the ax handle. He learns better ways to position your feet to bring the strength of your legs up into your arms and swing that ax handle. But the tree never comes down. He becomes great at swinging ax handles. He's just not much at getting the tree down. Maybe he goes through the motions because he's in denial. Or maybe he doesn't notice himself. Somewhere he's been convinced that it's going through the motions that gets the job done. It's knowing the words to the songs. It's knowing how to act out a blessing from God. It's knowing how to put a sermon together. It's knowing rhetorical techniques, psychology and business theory that if we can get all that right, then we can build a church. I'm sorry. Don't tell me so and so built a mega church and if he can, I can. I got news for you. Me and you, we need the Holy Ghost. Me and you, we don't have the personal charisma. We do not have the business sense. We do not have the psychological manipulation skills. Somebody said, well, he built a big church. No, he didn't. He just gathered a crowd. A football game will gather a crowd. A circus will gather a crowd. I'm not interested in a crowd. I want a church. And if we're gonna have a church, we cannot do it in our own strength we can swing the axe handle perfectly but without the edge without the power without the Holy Ghost we need God when the hungry walk in when the hurting walk in when the hopeless walk in when the helpless walk in it's not what I can do for them it's what he can do for them we need God I watch preachers remodel the church, fix the parking lot, appoint greeters and parking attendants, train their ushers, upgrade their music, get the audio visual working, smooth out the cadences of the service, and then sit back and wonder why revival doesn't come. Now I did not say one thing that I do not think needs to be done. 
But if that's where your trust is, your trust is misplaced. This thing was not born in Sigmund Freud's study. This thing was not born in some business college somewhere. This thing was not born in some mass psychology class. It was not born in the halls of academia. This thing was born in a little Bible college uh, where a bunch of kids got together and saw in the scriptures uh, that when they got the Holy Ghost, they talked uh, in other tongues uh, and they were just so little sophisticated that they thought if it could happen then, it can happen now. And they prayed through the holidays uh, until the Holy Ghost fell. And friends, that which was born in the spirit will not be completed in the flesh. Some trust in horses and in chariots, but we will trust in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. You can have revival but you'll do it in the Holy Ghost. You can have revival, but you'll only have it in the move of the Spirit. We will have revival, but we will have it when we quit just going through the motions and wearing the clothes and singing the songs and preaching the sermons and we give ourselves to an apostolic outpouring of the Holy Ghost. I'd like to see somebody get real in the Holy Ghost right here, right now. Somebody lose themselves in lifting up the name that is above every name. Let's praise him for a moment. Thank you, Jesus. We are one God, Jesus name, apostolic, tongue talking, hand clapping, aisle running, dancing in the spirit. We're not ashamed to be called by his name. We're not ashamed to have a move of the Holy Ghost in our services we are his church we are his people it is he who hath created us who hath made us it is he who hath saved us it is he who is worthy of our praises Young men, spend as much time in the prayer room as you do the basketball court. Spend as much time in the presence of God as you do in the fellowship hall or the youth center. Spend as much time worshiping, praising, lifting him up. Spend as much time listening to preaching as you do gospel music. I promise you, our strength is him. Our cutting edge is him. Our ability is him and he alone.
I'm trying, but it just ain't working. Check the ax head. Still on the end of the handle? If it's not, quit swinging and get some help. Quit going through the motions when nothing ever happens and check to see if the power is still there. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I'm not talking about backsliding. I'm not talking about quitting. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about being sure our trust is in God. Being sure our reliance is on his spirit. Realizing everything else is technique and it has its place, but it does not bring revival. It does not grow churches. It does not make lives and hearts and homes and families different. But when the Lord walks in, when the cutting edge is there, when the power is present, But he realized it. He didn't keep on swinging an empty ax handle against a tree that would never come down. No, 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 no. He said, I lost it. He went to the master. And he said, alas, master. I had it. Didn't mean to lose it. Wasn't planning on losing it. In fact, I was engaged in the work when I lost it. Wasn't playing around, wasn't fiddling around. I was doing my best when I lost it. Alas, master. Then he reveals the problem. For it was borrowed. I mean, this is a Bible school kid. How many times is he gonna need an ax? So rather than go down to Home Depot and buy one, that cost something. He went to Uncle John. Let me tell you something about Uncle John. He ain't never gonna loan you the good ax. He spent too much time sharpening that thing. That's his pride and joy. It's out in the woodshed hanging over the door. You ain't getting that ax. You wanna borrow Uncle John's ax, he's got an old worn out one that's dull that the head won't stay on the handle but he don't care, he ain't gonna be there. So he loans you that ax. What I'm saying is you can't borrow what I'm preaching about. You can't borrow it from your mom and dad. You can't borrow grandma and grandpa's ax. You can't borrow pastor's ax. You can't borrow yesterday's saints' axes. One generation cannot borrow this from the past generation. Every one of us has to pay the price, whatever it costs, and buy that ax for ourselves. You gotta buy into this thing. You can't just put your toe in the water. You can't have a fallback plan. You can't have, if this doesn't work out, I can always do this or that. You gotta sell out. You gotta get a hold of this thing. It's got to get down in the marrow of your bone. It's got to be part of you. It's gotta be your ax. You can't borrow from that dear sister that's such a prayer warrior, that she's always there early in the prayer room, that she's the one that salvaged so many services that the rest of us get lazy and we don't have time to pray like she prays. You can't borrow her prayers. You gotta start praying for yourself. You gotta start worshiping. You can't just let Uncle John do all the worship. You gotta get out there and worship yourself. You gotta buy this thing. I admit it's costly. To have the power of God in our midst is not automatic. 
It isn't just because we got the Holy Ghost 30 years ago or 20 or 10 or five or even last week. The power of God is prayed down. The power of God is worshiped down. The power of God is brought down by commitment, by understanding how God works, by coming together with the other saints of God in holiness, in righteousness, in forgiveness, in mercy, in kindness, in brother and sisterhood. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I. I know I don't have long left. God is bringing people to a point of comprehension and a point of hunger. But let me tell you what Elisha said. When he cried, alas, master, for it was borrowed. Elisha said, where did you lose it? You'll find it where you lost it. If you quit praying, get back in the prayer room. If you got depressed or angry and you're sitting on the back row and you quit worshiping, come on back up here and get where the glory is. If you lost it in your holiness, get back to what God called you to, separation from the world. If you lost it in your commitment, rediscover what it means to put God first in your life. So he cut a piece of a tree and he tossed it, Brother Kinsey, in that river, I think upstream. And when it came sailing past, uh, caught in the current, and it went over the place where that iron was, uh, the Bible says it didn't float. If it would have just floated, it would have floated downstream. If it would have just floated, he'd have had to jump in the river and chased it down. It not only violated the laws of specific gravity, but it violated the laws of inertia. The laws, the three laws of motion. Because the Bible says the iron swam. Now here's my question. Where did it swim to? It swam to the feet of that young man. God wants you to get a hold of this power. God isn't gonna keep it from you. God isn't gonna play games with you. God, if you go back to the peace of the tree, if you go back to the cross, God is gonna meet you more than halfway. The book says, one translation says, Elisha said then, pick it up for yourself. working in the kingdom. It is time, it is time for us to commit ourselves to being Pentecostal more than anything else. To forget sophistication, forget trying to impress, forget trying to be something we're not. It is time for us to go back to that simple faith that believes if I ask it, I'll receive it. If I worship, God will pour out his blessing. If I preach the word of God, it will work. If I touch people's lives through God's word, they will respond and hope will come. If I just keep the edge in my life, Now, I feel a hunger in this place today. I have felt it since the service began. I'm tired of flailing away at trees that never fall. I'm tired of shattering perfectly good ax handles in a dream that will never come true. I'm tired of going through the motions I was taught since a teenager and seeing nothing supernatural happen. I'm ready. I'm ready to go to the master and be deadly honest 
I'm not backslid. I'm not out in the world. I'm not playing around. I'm trying. But I'm telling you, I had the power, but I lost it. Will you give it to me? Will you restore unto me the joy? Will you restore to me your presence? Will you create another clean heart? Will you give me a fresh start? Will you grant me a new beginning? It's not in the Bible, but wouldn't it be something if that one last young man who thought at the last second and turned in the door and said to the master, will you go with us? Wouldn't it be something if he was the one carrying that borrowed ax in his hand? That he would be the one more than any other that would need to be sure the master was there. Maybe you're that young man. Maybe you're that young person, that pastor, that preacher, that saint of God. Your intentions are good. You want to make a difference. You want the kingdom to prosper. You want revival in your church. But you're tired of gestures and actions that have no power. Why don't you turn to the master tonight? Right now. Why don't you turn to the master right now? Alas, master. I had it, but I lost it. And the master will say, I will, I will. God, I want the supernatural in my ministry. I want the supernatural in my church. God, I want the edge, the power. I want the work done. I want it to matter that I drew breath. I want it to count that I lived I want that power reach out to him right now reach out to him oh God oh God too many years without the power too many swings without the axe head too many trips to the river bottom with no beams to show for it we want your power. We want a restoration of your power. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. He will. He will tonight. He will. He called you. It'll swim to you. If you'll reach out and take it, it's going to be right there. He's anxious to reinvigorate our ministries and our lives. He's anxious to bring Pentecostal power to our pulpits and our pews. He's anxious for his presence to fill our homes, our hearts. He's anxious for the world to know who we are. He's anxious for it to happen. Believe him right now as you open your heart across this building, whether you're able to make it to the front or not. Let's open our hearts to what God wants to give us in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Oh God. Reach out for yourself and take it. Reach out for yourself and take it. Claim it in Jesus' name. Oyanda aha Ti ayondo maila amasho We're nothing without you We have nothing we are nothing we can do nothing Without you we're incapable we're unable without you it's a waste of energy and time Without you no good will come of it without you it will have no lasting effect but with you, anything is possible. With you, anything can be done. With you, with you, in Jesus' name. Would you do something for me? Would you reach out to those around you right now? I want us to lay hands on one another and pray that God will fill the Florida district with an outpouring of His presence. 
that revival will come to this great district as never before. That he will restore to us. He will renew in us. He will lift us above our struggles, our disappointments. Reach to him, Jesus, the last master. Jesus, Jesus. Come on, young people, buy into this. Come on, young preacher, buy your own acts. Make the commitment tonight. It'll happen tonight. Come on, Dad. Come on, Grandma, Grandpa, come on. Don't be weary in well-doing. Jesus in your name, Savior in your name. I can't control, I want more. 